So seven inches, if I make a mark at seven inches at the left and at the right, then I can make a line here that is exactly parallel to my first line. So I, I will cut now a vertical line. And you know, I'm just eyeballing it. If you want to use a T-square to get a perfectly perpendicular line. So I'm going out to 20 inches and I'm drawing a second line. You notice I'm holding the tool like this, not straight up and down, but on, on an angle. So these are bevel cuts. And I can see that this perfect, this uh, first line is not perfect. So I don't get too obsessive about this kind of thing, <laughs> about perfect. There's a poet named Clarissa Pinkola Estes who has this great quote, perfect is the enemy of done. Be reasonable with yourself. Okay, so now picking up this slab. So these cuts are both, they're both uh, on the same angle. I'm gonna pick it up and put it right onto my bat. I do use Naga hide. This stuff you buy, it's vinyl. I call it Naga hide. I think you would call it vinyl. If you go to a Joann's Fabrics or one of the big fabric chains, it's like, uh, you know, some kind of plastic on one side. And the other side is a fabric. It's not a, a weave though, and so it doesn't shrink up underneath your um, pieces. This is great for trays. So to pick this up without warping it, I just like I gently pick it up from one corner without pulling on it. You know, I just lift it, and I want to release it from this sheet. Then I can pick it up the whole way, getting my hand under the other side. You don't have to feel rushed. You know, I think that people think when they pick up a slab, that <laughs> if they do it fast, it's gonna. <laughs> It's going to be better, and I don't think that fast equals better. So just take your time. It's stuck to my hands to a certain extent, so I really, um, I can really tip it without having it fall out. Then put the edge down, and just use my fingers to sort of curve it around, and there I go. I've overlapped those two beveled edges, and I'm going to show you in a minute a more detailed example of what it is I'm actually doing to compress these two slabs together to create one solid wall. And I'm not slipping and scoring. This is really important. I'm so glad you mentioned that because especially teachers, you know, they get so um, fanatical about <laughs> slipping and scoring. Um, and to good end, you know, if the pot is stiff, if the clay is stiff, I'll totally give it that assistance of slipping and scoring. But the truth is when your clay is as soft as this is, there's plenty of moisture and it's just going to stick as long as you compress it well. Compression is very important. Clay works well under compression. It does not work well under tension. So I'm just going to go over that one more time, that joint, and then I'll use my rubber rib. I love these Michael Sherrill ribs. It's like we all died and went to rib heaven, <laughs> you know? So. I just, uh, I'm taking it and I'm visually just again, eyeballing it to a round because I do want it to be pretty, pretty close to round. Uh, the, f the first thing that I notice when I, when you're slab building and you pull up a joint like that is that you get a little bit of a raised blip there. So I'm going to take that off. So this is just to give you a, a more detailed example of what that joint looks like. It's very important. So I cut it on a bevel, as I said. And this is, imagine this was the covered jars joint. So you've got these two beveled cuts and you want to marry them. You don't want them to go flush against each other the way you cut them because then when you press on it, you're going to end up with a thin spot and you don't want to overlap them completely because then you'll end up with a thick spot. This is the uh, Goldilocks. This is the Goldilocks joint cutting. You want them to be just right, which means that your, the thick part of one is going to go like into the center kind of of the other one. You see, so they're overlapped. And then my action, my action isn't to just press straight down. My action is kind of this. I'm pressing the lower part away and the upper part towards me. Just really trying to compress and also spread out the particles so that I wind up with one 
continuous slab. Once we finish it, we're going to cut it apart so you can see that it's actually pretty close to the same as the rest of the slab. So I would do the same thing to this that I had done to my other pot, my covered jar. And now we can take the knife and cut it across. And you can see that it has a little bit of a thickness, but it's really close to the rest of that wall. And, and that's what you want. So at this point, um, this slab is so soft that I would, in my, if I were in my studio, I would just be letting it set aside. I usually do things in increments of three. So I would, have, I would roll another one and make another cylinder and do it three times until I had uh, them all sitting there, in which case the first one might be ready. It might be stiff enough to handle the, the strain of what I'm about to do. This isn't. So I have, I have one ready over here um, that I prepped. And it's, it's hard to visually show you how it's different than this is like, it moves with my hands so easily. This doesn't move with my hands so easily. I don't know if that's going to convey, but you, you know, like so much of this is guidance for you. There's this mantra that I am really on about these days, and it's the three P's. It's play, process, practice. You can't get anywhere uh, in any creative endeavor without all three of those things. So the first thing we're going to do is roll a slab for uh, the foot. So take your, um, <clears throat> these come now, these metal serrated tools come really super stiff. I think they're steel. And then there's these ones that are aluminum. I like the bendy ones. So I am scoring because flat against flat, you know, that's, that's tension and clay doesn't like that. So I just give it a little extra chance of holding together there. And the neat thing about this is that the, the actual pot becomes my template. I roll out this slab and I just have to lay it over. I tap the outer edge gently and now I have a template for the bottom. And what I want to do is cut just a little bit larger than the impression that I just made so that I have enough of an extra edge to visually in indicate foot. I want this pot to sit on the table and have that foot be visible. So I'll scratch this up as well and just give it as much encouragement to connect to that covered jar. I take my fingers and I just run them along the, the upper edge of that knife cut. I'm not really pressing hard because if I press too hard, I'd end up, instead of just rounding this edge, I would end up smushing it. So I flip it over and I do the same thing to the other side. And now it's ready to go on with the assistance of a bit of water. There seems to be a big uh, debate in the ceramics world about slip versus water. <laughs> I was just always figured that um, if you scored it, you've got all these little tiny pieces and you use water, it turns into slip. So actually adding slip is like adding material and that just messes up the joint for me. That's my two cents on that issue. So then because I know that this circle of clay is slightly larger than the opening, uh, than the outer edge of the opening, I'm going to lay it on with a bit of room to spare. And you can see just by that, you know, that it fits, fits fine. And if it's, if it's needing a little pull, you pull it. It is clay after all, so it's going to give you plenty of forgiveness. So I'm just really putting it in place, going around, putting it in place. And now I take, uh, I just take my middle finger and I'm compressing it, just tapping it right over the top of the foot. All of these slab built pots are constructed upside down first. So I always do the bottom first. And when we flip it over, we'll be working on the top. So what I did was I, I, I usually work with two banding wheels, one tall and one low, just because over the years, you know, the, sh the old shoulder starts to s talk to you and it's easier on my shoulder to, to get into this. So what I want to do is um, add a coil to reinforce the, the joint between the wall and the floor. And so just take a nice soft piece of clay. This is just to illustrate what goes on inside that pot. Um, Cause it sure is hard for us to be able to show you that inside the pot. So it's a pretty, pretty thick coil and say, this is the floor and this is the wall of the pot. I'm going along and I'm pressing down into the floor like this. 
So I'm really getting it attached. I mean, I'm going into the joint, but um, my pressure is really down, down and in. But I'm not worrying about the upper part yet. So then the next thing I do is I smooth the entire coil into towards the center of the pot. And then I come around the edge and I'm pressing up into the wall. But as you'll, as you'll see, I do that while supporting the outside of the wall so it doesn't get all warped. This is why you have to um, let that cylinder stiffen up before you start working on it. Um, because otherwise you get this like bulge there. 